am excited to welcome you to the third monitor side chat in our series, Tux Entrepreneurs Tackle Tough Questions. This event is being put on by the Tux Entrepreneurial Alumni Network, or TEAM, as a part of the Tux Entrepreneurship Center in close partnership with Alumni Relations. For those of you who don't know what TEAM is, this group serves as a resource for alumni in the technology and startup spaces, helps alumni looking to transition from the corporate world to the technology and startup space, and as a resource for the university and PEC. I'd like to introduce you to some of the folks here with me today who come out of TEAM and PEC. Iggy Molliver, Shelby Schultz, Luke Frazier, Josh Goldman, Kevin Oy, Josh Kappelman, Mark Kesslin, um, and Amy McDonald, who's with the university and makes all of this possible. Um, we're gonna start off with a panel discussion and we'll leave open about 20 minutes at the end for questions. Please feel free to submit your questions along the way and we'll do our best to get to all of them before we close out for the evening. My name is Brittany Sokoloff and I'm an alumni from the class of 2011 and a member of the Teen New York chapter. I was so grateful to find my way home to the entrepreneurship program during my time at Tufts. I remember listening to the speakers that Jack Derby brought into class, reading through company case studies and taking away one critical message. An entrepreneur has to be resilient. Forming a company isn't easy. Navigating your way from startup to success brings daily unique challenges that you have to adeptly maneuver your way through. Now, while I opted for law rather than entrepreneurship, the lessons remain. Indeed, the strengths of an entrepreneur, determination, perseverance, learning how to pivot, are relevant to people in most industries. And I think that's why this series is so special. Because who better to charter our course through these unique times than entrepreneurs who have built a career doing just that, chartering their own unique path. Now, in addition to COVID, our country is facing an awakening fighting to overcome racial injustice that somehow is still laced into our everyday lives. It is more important than ever that we use our voices and stand up for what is right, what is just, and what we believe in. Entrepreneurs do that every day. They build a company that stands for a principle that they believe in, and they fight tooth and nail to make sure everyone shares those beliefs. So follow in the footsteps of great entrepreneurs and use your voices to share the message of racial justice and equality. And please don't stop sharing that message until we can get rid of the hate around us. Without further ado, let's turn to tonight's talk. On behalf of TEEN in connection with TEC, I am excited to introduce you to Chloe Epstein, Matt Leeds, Wendy Baer, and Jordan Kibblestaff, who will be speaking about the impact that COVID-19 has had on the food and beverage industry. When Chloe became pregnant with her first child, she realized the need for a frozen treat that satisfied her sweet tooth and she could feel great about feeding her family. One without any artificial ingredients, colors, or flavorings. To bring this dream to life, Chloe left her job as a Manhattan assistant district attorney and in 2010 founded Chloe's, a brick and mortar store serving her creation of soft serve fruit with just fruit, water, cane sugar, and nothing to hide. In 2014, Chloe expanded out of her New York City retail store with the launch of her delicious line of CPG frozen pops, and Chloe's quickly became one of the fastest growing frozen novelty brands in the United States. Currently, Chloe's pops are distributed in more than 13,000 stores nationwide, including Kroger, Albertson Safeway, Publix, and Costco. In 2017, Chloe participated in the Chobani Food Incubator when the company was selected as a leading brand with the best opportunity to disrupt, innovate, and inspire a multi-billion dollar category. She has also been recognized by Food and Wine and Fortune as one of the most innovative women in food and drink. Chloe received her BA in political science from Tufts University and her JD from the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law. She resides in New York City with her husband and three children. And one extra brag for this woman who already seems to do everything, Chloe and her husband have recently joined as co-chairs of this year's Brighter World campaign, 
a $1.5 billion comprehensive fundraising campaign that bolsters the Tufts experience and strengthens the university's international leadership in higher education. So we want to give her an extra special thanks for her commitment to the university. Matt Leeds is a partner in the flagship fund at L. Catterton, where he oversees the firm's food and beverage investments. Prior to joining L. Catterton, Matt was a private equity investor at Irving Place Capital in New York City and at Lake Capital in Chicago. Matt also worked in brand management at Procter & Gamble and began his career in investment banking at J.P. Morgan, where he worked in the consumer, retail, and industrials groups. Matt was an Amadar scholar at Tufts, where he graduated magna cum laude with a triple major in mathematics, quantum economics, and psychology. He received an MBA with honors from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania as a former co-president of Wharton's Private Equity and Venture Capital Association. Wendy Baer is a food and beverage innovation, sustainability, and productivity consultant, enabling companies to create and scale great tasting products with optimal supply and gross margin solutions. She is a founding member of Tufts Nutrition Council with an advisory role to the Dean of the Friedman School and the Director of the USDA HNRCA Shaping Strategy to Maximize Policy, Education, and Research. She's a member of the Nutrition Entrepreneurship Program, mentoring students on essentials of innovation. Before starting her consulting practice, Concept to Commercialization, Bundy held a number of R&D, CSR, packaging innovation, and global supply chain roles at Keurig Dr. Pepper, the White Wave Food Company, the AJO PLC, Bodden Flavors, and Kraft Foods. And just to touch on her most recent consulting endeavors, Wendy led coffee R&D and packaging innovation for Keurig Dr. Pepper, driving coffee brand innovation, supply chain optimization, and setting their 2025 sustainability packaging strategy for over 125 brands. Wendy graduated from the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts with a master's in nutrition science and policy and a graduate certificate in sustainable agriculture and food systems. She also holds a bachelor of science in chemical engineering from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Wendy currently lives in Denver, Colorado, where she enjoys cycling, hiking, cooking, and getting lost in a good book. She's married with three children, two grandchildren, and Australian Shepherd dog. And then finally, our amazing moderator tonight, as founder of Kibblestadt Cellars, Jordan uh, Kibblestadt seeks to create wines that stand out. His passion for food and wine permeates everything he does. In 2009, he founded Free Flow Wines, a wine on tap company focused on improving the quality and sustainability of the wine we drink in restaurants. He sold the company in 2016 and has been focused on other projects since then. He initially cut his teeth in wine working harvest in California, Argentina, Chile, and Australia. Kibblestadt Cellars is Jordan's creative outlet, and recently he opened California's first wine bar, bringing his passion for new California food and wine to one place. So with that, let me hand it over to Jordan. Awesome, thank you, Brittany. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, I'm excited, I am sitting here in my beautiful wine garden in Sonoma, California, and a uh, great venue to host everybody this evening. We have an amazing panel and what we're going to try to do is talk about some of the things that we've seen uh, as the impact of COVID on the food and beverage space and then spend the bulk of the time talking about where we see the impact of COVID shaping the future of the food and beverage industry. So to start, I'm going to turn to the panel and talk about the direct impacts that each of you have experienced uh, from COVID on your business or the businesses that you work with. So Chloe, as you're in the middle of a rapidly growing food beverage startup. Can you tell us a little bit about how COVID impacted your plans for 2020? Yes, hi, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to uh, be at home, but here with everyone. Um, so really pre-COVID, we, uh, we were on track to have like our most successful first quarter um, coming out of a very successful 2019. We were launching eight new SKUs. Um, including our first, the first oat milk um, based pop um, on the market, um, along with some other exciting partnerships that we had formed with Marvel and Zumba. And um, it was all supposed to kind of hit the reset shelves um, in the first quarter. And generally that happens in most markets uh, in around March, April, which was the exact uh, perfect timing for um, 
for COVID. So for us, um, while we did have some hiccups in the supply chain, as, um, as um, you know, you might imagine, the biggest challenge for us was really um, getting our new innovation that we had expected to see on shelf um, during that time. Um, it was really just delayed. And uh, most of the markets, as I'm sure everybody noticed, were kind of cutting back on the quote unquote non-essential products like um, ice cream and novelties and that's our category. So um, they, they were prioritizing the essentials. So, you know, older SKUs weren't having as much trouble finding their ways to the shelves, but the new innovation um, was definitely tough to find. I mean, it's much more challenging for a supermarket to, to uh, carry on resets during this type of challenging time. So um, that for us was our biggest challenge. Um, we, you know, we were just kind of delayed. Um, now that we're kind of into a more of a second phase of this this um, whole like, pandemic, I guess, um, we are seeing the resets are mostly completed, um, you know, a few months later than we had hoped. And so it's a lot easier to find our product. Um, but I would say that was really our biggest challenge. Thank you. And, and Wendy, you've spent most of your career in supply chain and innovation. And obviously, to Chloe's point, this is a time where innovation kind of gets stalled a little bit as everybody tries to figure out supply chain. What did you see with your clients as they responded to the disruptions in supply chain and actually just trying to meet the shift in demand uh, to the retail outlets? Yeah, good evening. Thanks for um, having me. Appreciate it. And I, I think there was just a very big difference this time around, you know, 10 years ago, innovating in a downturn and establishing fast, flexible supply chains um, to, to respond to that. Uh, and also laddering down from higher price points to lower price points 10 years ago, very different to um, what's been happening over the last three months. So a lot of supply chains over time really want to do skew rationalization and reduce the number of, of products are selling, this has been a perfect time for companies to do that as they have focused on getting large formats, especially in the dairy case. It's the first time I've worked in almond milk and oat milk and, and soy milk for many, many years. It's the first time I've seen a refrigerated door flip to gallon dairy milk because you know consumers are eating one, two, three more meals at home a day um, before restaurants started opening back up. and milk consumption, large format dairy consumption, and alternate dairy was there. And you, everybody kind of saw that in the, the products that you couldn't find, you know, so there used to be 40 different types of toilet paper. There are now four types of toilet paper in the marketplace. So that's what supply chains have been doing and suppliers is getting really focused on their top selling um, SKUs, making sure they're maximizing their capacity in their supply chain towards that. And retailers have been doing the same thing as they've been having to, you know, keep things stocked overnight and, and rapidly supply like the less, the, the fewer number of SKUs and the, the capacity that they can handle. You know, to echo Chloe's point, um, I was working in, in two major um, programs over the last year that culminated into selling in 30 new products into the dairy case. Um, in February to the top six retailers, everything stopped in March. Not one of those 30 new products went to market because the retailers just couldn't handle bringing in new products when they couldn't supply the day to day. And the, the second area, you know, that was really impacted, it seems to be coming back, but I was spending a lot of time doing M&A due diligence and business development due diligence on regulatory quality operations supply chain. Um, for private equity companies and for startups and all of that just slowed down, you know, because of, of risk and, and uncertainty. Um, I think a lot of that will come back. Uh, I think food innovation will definitely come back. Um, and, I, and I think there's, there's bigger, even brighter opportunities um, in areas to focus. Thank you. And that's a nice segue, actually, because Matt, that's your world, really, in the private equity transaction side, looking at both growth equity and also investment in emerging or later stage emerging brands. So how do you see the landscape of M&A transitioning right now? Did you see the same sort of 
pause across the board for a couple of months? And when do you see activity starting to pick up again in the world of both M&A and investment into the food and beverage category? Uh, it's a good question. And hey, everybody, nice to, nice to virtually be here with all of you. Um, I think the whole M&A universe and the investing universe more broadly, whether it's in private businesses like where I spend my time or in the public markets, uh, investing in general is not very easy when there's so much uncertainty out in the world. And I think there's more, at least in the earlier innings of COVID, I think things are starting to resolve themselves now. But when this was all beginning, there was just a complete shock to the system and a massive amount of uncertainty. And you can see it in the VIX, right, which is an index that tracks volatility in the public markets. But um, consumer behavior took a shock to the system like it's rarely ever had before, at least in, in my 12 years of investing. Uh, so when you look at what happens to the investing universe when there's so much uncertainty, it really goes on pause. Um, and there are massive shifts that are taking place in terms of the way that we all live our lives. Um, there's this whole, like, one, of my, one of my firm strategies is we invest against a backdrop of permanent changes in consumer behavior, long-term trends in consumer behavior. Um, and so we're, we're sitting here talking about sustainability and Wendy, to your point, you know, down with dairy, up with plant-based alternatives. And so there's this really, what felt like a really systemic long-term change in the way that we operate. And then all of a sudden the world just, just turns on a dime. Um, and so you have, you have these trends where over the course of the last 60 years, since like 1960 or so, there's been this movement of people consuming food um, away from home at the expense of food at home. So back in the 60s in these like halcyon days of America, everybody sat in their homes, they all cooked dinner, they in front of their black and white TV together and food at home was a big thing. Um, and over time that has shifted with people being busy and dual income houses and the rest. And so there's been this very steady climb year after year after year, where only two years ago did we reach equilibrium of 50% food consumed at home and 50% food consumed away from home. And then COVID comes and in April it's 98-2, right? 98% of food is consumed at home and 2% of food is consumed away from home. So, you know, how can we I, I spend my time in a mixture of food and beverage investing and in restaurant investing. So for us as investors, it was really dark and murky in the early innings of all of this because you just, you can't tell where things are going to land. And companies, you know, the, the, to answer your question specifically, the M&A market for regular way companies just fell apart completely. There were no deals being done, period. Um, and the only transactions that were out there in the world were companies getting rescue financing to find a way to shore up their balance sheets and survive um, through however long the storm lasts. And only now, you know, we're basically four months into this or so, just about four months in, only now is the market starting to thaw and only now are companies starting to come back and sell themselves or raise money for more traditional kind of fundings um, as opposed to just pure rescues. Uh, so yeah, that, that has been, it's been a wilder moment to live through than the 2008 crisis, I think in many ways, because that was at least localized. This is a tectonic shift in the way that we, that we all operate. And I think that's a really interesting point. When we talk about tectonic shifts, you talked about this changing landscape to consumption at home and consumption uh, out at restaurants on premise. You know, And what I keep asking myself is, are consumers going to have permanently changed or that trend that we were witnessing for the last 60 years, are we going to see a reset? Because I think people, when they're home right now and looking at their bank accounts are realizing, wow, if I cook at home more, spend less out, I have a lot more to spend on other discretionary spend. They're spending more on the quality of the products they're bringing into their home, maybe more on localized adventure travel. But you know, I, the other interesting thing that I saw was a shift back to staples. So I'd be really curious, you know, Wendy, you've worked with a lot of the large organizations on innovation. Do you see people shifting back to brands that almost for lack of a better term, are comfort brands versus innovation brands like what Chloe's doing. And how do we, how do you, I'd love both of your thoughts on sort of this trend of people towards away from innovation or towards comfort and your thoughts on whether that's sustained or, or we'll see that shift back again. Yeah, I, I think we don't know everything yet, you know, and, um, and that's the murkiness that, that Matt Kinsey gets to. So I think they're, there certainly is a shift back to comfort and what people knew. And I've got, I now I, overnight, I have to eat one, two or three more meals at home a day than I, I've done before. So I'm going to shift to what I know and back to staples and I'm stuck at home. 
So I'm going to learn how to bake and teach my kids how to sew and all the things that we forgot to do over the last couple of generations. But I, I also think people have figured, I'm having these really interesting conversations. I've been doing this for 30 years and, you know, all three of my kids when I was pregnant did 100,000 miles on an airplane with me, you know, for my job. And I'm talking to people going, I just don't think I ever have to travel again. I think I've learned that I can actually, all these meetings that I think I need to get face to face, we're successfully doing them. So I think that's the piece we're all trying to figure out is when all is said and done and we all feel safe and, you know, the lawyers sign off on business liability to travel again, um, Will will people do that to the extent? Will people eat out more often, or will they say, "I can, I can manage my job and be at home in time for dinner. I can stay at home for breakfast with my family, get them to school, and manage my job." Those are two really big conversations I've been having with a few folks that are in the staple world. You know, over the last couple of months, is what's going to sustain, and not. And, and I just I think that we just don't know um, unless somebody else has some you know different insight from. Mintel or IRI or, or um, you know, that I haven't seen, but I think time will tell. Some things are certainly going to stick. You know, Chloe, I'd be interested to hear from you. Certainly people are going to continue down the path of natural and sustainable lifestyles and healthy foods. That's not going away anytime soon, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I hope that, um, in my mind, I see the pandemic really accelerating con the consumer trends that we were seeing before it all started in that I think uh, in that first um, phase where everyone was really just concerned with stocking up and all those pan, you know, making sure you had the on hand, the pantry items. Once you started to see those challenger brands, which is how I kind of like to refer to us more than a startup, but more of a challenger brand. Once we were able to get on shelf, um, uh, I think we were seeing that people were a willing to try, not maybe forced trial, just because you kind of bought whatever you found, and also just trial because you were you've been home, you are you know reading more online, more getting more kind of inspired by different types of trends like healthy eating and clean ingredients, and kind of um, I think it was it's it it was kind of just enforcing um, that there is a way to find cleaner, healthier foods. And like you were saying with um, finding that you have spent less money out, uh, you're a little more willing to potentially try new things at, that might be, you know, cost more or um, just that you wouldn't necessarily have tried before. So, um, you know, it's, it's before COVID, we were really seeing people migrate towards, you know, the parameters of the market to, to the fresh and to frozen and kind of avoiding the center aisles. Um, and there was a return to that um, for COVID. But I do think that once we kind of get back in a groove of um, prioritizing and just like seeing that there is other, you know, these challenger brands out there, I think, um, I think, it will continue to kind of trend um, in that in that direction. Absolutely, and I completely agree that sustainability is something that like healthy eating is not going away anytime soon. In the, in the out beverage industry, the thing that I found the most fascinating, and maybe get everybody's sixty second take on this, is the prolific rise of hard seltzer at a time when consumers are theoretically moving towards healthier, more sustainable beverages or products. And then we get to what is arguably the most synthetic alcoholic beverage on the market becoming the hottest trend in, in the US right now. So that was definitely one that caught me off guard over the last couple of years um, was how quickly that rose. Um, anybody have any insights on that? Uh, yeah, I've actually, I've spent time looking at a couple of seltzer businesses, alcoholic seltzer businesses, and also traditional seltzer businesses. Uh, I think that the so the White Claw movement, if you want to, uh, if you want to dub it that, um, I think there's. It depends on which trend you're focused on, because if your trend is about, if you're if you're thinking through the lens of what is sustainable and organic and natural, like that is one vector that the world is following, but that's also not the only vector. I think there's a, definitely a piece here around caloric intake, right? There's a, there is a real trade-off between the craft beer movement, where think about where we were six years ago all that was out there in the world was this explosion of multiple you know, brands and varieties and triple IPAs and the rest. 
that it really exploded, took a lot of shelf space and was a lot of source of a lot of dollars. Uh, as that movement has, has, has kind of flattened, right, no pun intended, uh, Seltzer has been rising on its own, right? Seltzer is a beautiful category. And seltzer consumption is up dramatically as carbonated soft drinks come down, seltzer comes up, there's no calories, the whole thing, the, the health element. And then as you move away from 300 calories in a, in a delicious but highly caloric double IPA, um, a seltzer with 100 calories, uh, which is, you know, the four elements of, of any food or beverage is taste, convenience, price, and health, right? And I think if you think about White Claw, just run it through that filter for a moment, the t it's acceptable taste. It's it's sessionable, right? You can drink multiple of them. It is only 100, 110 calories. The price point is fairly reasonable. And so, you know, you, you can actually understand why that rise coincides really nicely with regular seltzer, uh, where people are just consuming more and more and more of the traditional seltzer um, themselves. So that's on the, on the seltzer side, which I think is interesting. But then the other part about all this, and this goes back to kind of where Chloe was just coming from, when you think about this idea of what other trends are out happening in the world and this idea of, of the trend of, of natural and sustainable and, and the rise of the challenger at the expense of the Oscar Myers of the world. Um, it just depends, you know, I'm a believer in, and we as a firm are a believer in a lot of those same trends. And the question is really just, are you talking about over the next six months or are you talking about over the next 10 years? Because I think you may have different answers for both of them. It depends on your time horizon. Um, but in a shock to the system moment that we're in now, I think the the clear and Wendy to your point about uh, Mintel and, and IRI data, which is basically you can get all this amazing data because what gets scanned in the grocery store gets transmitted into a database and you can actually buy and consume all that data. So you can see by week, by category, by region, what's happening in Campbell soup sales and in Oreo sales and all those. Those sales continue to be really strong and really robust. Uh, and I think those at least in the, in the near term. If it were just a one-time pantry load, I think you would have seen that fizzle out already, but it's continuing um, at a higher rate than I would have guessed a few months back. And that's the same we're seeing in, in Alcbev is the return to some of these staples and those not abating. You know, when you see smaller brands being down 30, 40, 50%, you see large, large brands, the like Kendall Jacksons of the world, the Gallows up three to five, 6% overall and that's sustaining. The other interesting thing that uh, I observed was uh, price sensitivity. Premiumization has been happening both in food and in beverage for the last eight, nine years. As we came out of the last recession, people were trading up. And part of that was, Chloe, to your point earlier, that healthy lifestyle, being willing to spend a dollar more for a product that you know comes from a more authentic source, has a better uh, um, you know, ingredients list. But we saw a little bit of a, a decline from that, at least in Alcbev, and I'd be very curious for the rest of you in the food space, are you seeing people trade down a little bit right now? Or are you seeing that was an initial reaction? And obviously we're dealing with categorically high unemployment and other things that will take time uh, to abate. But are we seeing people trade back up to that trial of the higher priced items as we come out of the instability, as you said, Matt, of the first couple innings? So, you know, Wendy, Chloe, what are you seeing there? And I think there's a couple of things, you know, that, that are true, whether it was you know, the downturn in 2000 or the global economic crisis 10 years ago or now, the second a consumer tries something at a different price point and likes it, you've, you've lost a little bit of your ability to, to have a higher price point, clear defendable point of difference. So, and, and a, lot of, a lot of products are improving in quality. So I think that's what's also happened here is people have tried other brands. They've been forced to try other brands because of, of lack of products on shelf. So that's always something that you need to pay attention to. I think in Bev Alcohol, after spending about 13 years there, right? Um, the one thing that, yeah, people want to know what's in their food. They want to know what's in their beverage alcohol. I get that. They want things to be clean, pure, and simple. Except there's always a little something, something, I think, in the back of people's mind when they reach out for something with, with alcohol in it. It's, it's supposed to taste a little tough, right? And it, it's, not as, it's not healthy for me. Um, so they give in a little bit in that space and they want it to kind of fit that edgy profile and, and, and have that badge there as well. Now, having said all that, there's definitely a, a movement for you know, clean, pure and simple in, in Bev alcohol. And I think you know, to Matt's point on seltzer, you've got Fever Tree out there really doing something as the challenger brand and meaning something in that whole cleaner, better for you mixers. Um, 
and the downturn to calories, I think, or the, the looking for, for calories, I think, is there as well. Um, but I think just making sure that you're always understanding your brand health, you understand your price point, your elasticity, if you will, but um, you have to have that point of differentiation to keep winning those consumers back when they've had the opportunity to try a brand that might be slightly different, but of equal um, quality in this, this type of situation. Chloe, what do you think? I, I would I would agree with everything you said. I think for us, you know, like I said before, the hope is that um, people are willing to, you know, spend a little more for for the quality ingredients. Um, but we have always tried to remain um, competitive, cost competitive. Um, so especially during these months, which it, it ironically just coincides with what's going on, we this is our time for kind of lowering our prices, the deals, the couponing, um, it's summer. So we're really on deal everywhere. Um, and that's been very important to us. And we've invested a lot in that. Um, and, you know, there were points uh, when this started that we were going to maybe back off of it slightly just because of the, the hits we were taking in the beginning um, and not getting our, our product on shelf. But um, in the end, it for us made more sense and just seemed to be important to keep us at a lower price point um, during the summer months and be able to compete um, in, at that level. Awesome. I'm, I'm going to change subjects a little bit and this will be a poll of our panel. How many of you have been out to eat at a restaurant since COVID started? Raise a hand. Anybody? Out outdoor? Does outdoor counts. You've been out to a restaurant to eat. Okay. And how recently, if we just go around, how recently were you comfortable going out and sitting and dining at a restaurant? Chloe, let's start with you. It was last week, I believe, um, we went out to an outdoor restaurant. I wasn't sure I'd be ready, but it was like, it, it, it felt super comfortable. I was actually surprised by um, how normal it felt. Um, and we were all very happy that we, that we took the chance and um, everyone felt great. And I don't think that I'm ready for, for an inside experience yet, but um, outdoor was great. Wendy? Yeah, um, I live in a state that, that opened up at the beginning of, of June at 50% and um, particip you know, went in and, and had a, a great pizza at a local uh, restaurant. We were the only people inside the restaurant. Um, so we got great service. It was uh, faster than, than I thought uh, it would be, but uh, as expected, you know, people are gonna come back at their own pace and their own time. Um, we, my family and I have gone out a couple of different times. Um, you know, I'm guessing that might change as things kind of move forward, given, given the, the situation that we're finding ourselves in, in the state that I live in. Matt? I have not been out to eat in a restaurant yet. And I will put the blame or the credit for that squarely at the feet of my wife, who's also a Tufts alum, um, but she's a doctor and she uh, spends all of her time with infectious disease folks. And the, it's so interesting for me to watch this. So she's at Yale uh, and I get to sit in and, and watch their weekly Zoom calls about the way that they're seeing the world and the way that they're seeing spread. And it's so funny because we all, no, I'm not, uh, I don't have the backbone to be an entrepreneur like most of you are on this panel, but, um, you know, you are winning. I, I'm an optimist as well, and you guys clearly are. So then the question becomes, you know, if you're, if you're an optimist, you're going to live one way. And if you're in the medical field and you're just surrounded by negative, you know, data and scary facts for, for so much of your life, um, it's a very slow moving exodus from all of this. And so I, you know, we haven't been yet. And I get to see the data from our, from our restaurant businesses as well. You know, we own 20 something restaurants and 2000 something doors in this country uh, of restaurants. And our dine-in traffic is, I mean, it's, it's terrible um, to watch, you, know, you watch these businesses that are healthy otherwise and how they're, how they're just struggling to make a third of the sales, they could do a third of the sales they did pre-COVID. It's, it's rough. And I think the restaurant industry, you know, it's really the, the bankruptcy so far have been pretty light, but there's gonna be a lot more coming because people are, I think people are voting with their wallets that they're not ready yet. Um, I think we're seeing it on a pretty broad scale that people are not ready to dine out yet. Um, I'm super excited when I'm eventually allowed out of my quarantine, but, uh, but not today. 
it's funny you say that, Matt. My wife's a nurse practitioner, and uh, I share a similar thing. And the conversations around our dinner table when I'm about to open a restaurant in the middle of a pandemic, having a wife that's a nurse practitioner, were yeah, I will just say colorful. Um, but uh, but no, I mean it's it, it certainly is. I think Chloe, to your point, consumers are feeling reasonably confident being outside, well spaced, and distanced from each other. I do think that. If you're a restaurant where the vast majority of your seating is indoors, it's going to be challenging for the foreseeable future. I wonder, and here's another uh, um, thing I just love to throw out to the panel. Did COVID save the meal delivery kits? Because as many of us know, those were certainly a, a series of companies that were hurting uh, on, a, on a financial performance basis. And from what I've seen, have rebounded really strongly during COVID. So do we think that there was a seismic change in people actually getting these meal delivery kits to home. Matt, I see you laughing. Go ahead. Uh, this goes back to the same question of, are you looking at a six-month horizon or a 10-year horizon? Uh, and so we, we owned a meal kit company. We owned Home Chef, which we sold to Kroger. And our big insight, we, we made three times our money in that deal. We escaped quickly and got out. But man, meal kits are hard. And I think the, the big insight there is that consumers – I think that the rise of boxes of all kinds and kits of, you know, Birch Box and, and Stitch Fix and everything else, um, and then all these meal delivery kits, the insight was that people want to have a deeper level of engagement with their food, but they don't necessarily want to do all the work. And I think the meal kits are still a lot of work. And you go back to this idea of convenience, and I think that in the, maybe in the next few months, maybe until people are starting to return to some level of normalcy, they'll continue to, to stay afloat. But yeah, I, I will. I will be very surprised if Blue Apron is still a solvent public company uh, five years from now. And I think that consumer behavior is just people are people have tried the kits and don't repeat. And they say, you know what? It's nice. It's a cute idea. It's worth trying, but it's not making my life that much easier. So therefore, it's not worth continuing. We have multiple uh, tough salams in that space, as many of you know. One of the co-founders of uh, Blue Apron was a tough salam, as well as uh, another tough salam has a. Uh, sort of a hybrid of that called sous vide that's launched as well, which is trying to simplify, to your point, the uh, convenience aspects of it. So kind of in line with that, Wendy, Chloe, um, have you seen any channel changes for your brands? As you know, we've seen a lot of companies launch direct consumer plays with their brands during this period of time. Obviously, frozen pops are going to be a little bit hard to ship direct to consumer. But Wendy, as you work with staple brands, have you seen any of them move to some of these recurring direct consumer models to take advantage of the increased consumption at home? I think a lot of people that I, you know, a lot of companies that I've talked to that either didn't have their own e-commerce or weren't well tied in with um, Amazon or Walmart or, or Target are upping their game and, and focus in that space. What is less obvious to a lot of consumers, I think, is, you know, the supply chains, our, 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 the conventional food and beverage supply chain, you know, the United States has enjoyed 50, 60 years of optimization, but that also means it got very focused and efficient in segments. So the food service supply chain um, versus the retail supply chain, um, two very different things. And you, what, I, what, I, what I see companies more working on is food service supply chain has basically died. How do I get product and my ingredients um, and materials out of that supply chain into the retail supply chain. It, it hasn't been a, an easy shift. And one that um, might not necessarily be a product that you, you, you want, but one that I think isn't as transparent is all of the concentrate for beverages, that concentrate that goes into um, the fountain systems that you enjoy at the movie theaters or at the restaurants that you go to, it's a really different supply chain than getting, it's the same concentrate, but it's a different supply chain than getting it into a can, a bottle that you're buying at retail. So you might notice that you can buy plenty of the top three or four brands of soda pop and seltzers, but maybe that fourth, fifth, and sixth brand, it's really hard, it's been really hard to find. And I think that's gonna continue to happen as well. So I think people, yep, are trying to get into e-commerce and, and Chloe will have some uh, experience in that space beyond me. But there's a lot of other segmented supply chain issues that people are overcoming to, to, to survive and move forward. Well, it, Jordan, you, you prefaced it by saying we, it's probably hard to uh, ship direct-to-consumer frozen. 
which is why we avoided it um, for years. And we actually started looking into it and had the wheels in motion right before um, this all started, which was lucky um, so that we could kind of launch it. Um, it took much longer than we expected, so it only happened a few weeks ago, but we are still um, really finding it very challenging. But it is something that we found we, we needed to um, be able to offer at this time. And um, we are you know, hoping to get it running more smoothly and we'll definitely um, plan to keep it um, post, post this period. Um, but it is certainly, I think, critical for um, a food business right now uh, to be able to have that option. We are, like Wendy said, um, putting a lot more of our efforts and energies in, in places like Amazon Fresh and um, uh, Fresh Direct and, and, and vendors like that. But um, to be able to do it ourselves is, is definitely was something we needed to prioritize. Great. I mean, I think that's exactly what, what everyone's curious about. And I think every brand is looking at engaging more directly with consumers, obviously not just from a margin perspective, but also from an access to your consumers and that feedback loop that's created by direct access to your most loyal consumer base. And, and that's really, I think the intrinsic value of building your direct consumer channel is not really that it will ever overtake your retail channel, but more importantly, it creates a direct connection to your your top customers who really love the brand and, and create a feedback loop. So with that, we're gonna transition to our feedback loop and uh, turn it over to Q&A. Um, just one comment to that? Yes. Yeah, I, I think to build on Chloe's point and your point, you know, a lot of these, a lot of companies have been trying to sort this out and been putting plans in place. And I think this issue, the situation has helped people do that. Most notably, you would have seen five or six weeks ago, Pepsi announced they're launching their, their DTC supply chain um, and platform. But if you actually go on it as a consumer, it's pretty focused. You have to buy a bundle of stuff. You can't just, you know, like you can't go on Amazon and cherry pick what you want. That direct to consumer platform that Pepsi's launched is buy these four potato chip brands, buy these cereal brands, buy these four beverages. It's very specific. And I think that's a really good example of how they got, they took the situation and instead of being as all their SKUs, they bundled them to go fast and to provide um, a quick solution maybe more of a meal delivery kit, if you will, the, you know, the Pepsi way, um, or a snack delivery kit, if you will, the Pepsi way. That's an interesting one to watch. And just, I thought about it as you were, as you were speaking. Thank you. All right, well, thanks so much. We've got some great questions coming in from our audience. If you've got additional questions, please type them into the Q&A and we'll work on getting to them. Um, so the first question that I'm seeing is, COVID seems to be forcing quick service restaurants to reduce their menus and serve core products and deliver it through drive-through delivery in the fastest way possible. Is that a sustainable strategy over the next 12 months to try and maintain revenue? Matt, you, you're, you're closer to that space than I am. You wanna give some commentary? Sure. Um, yeah, I think the, the idea of simplifying the menu is it's prevalent both in the restaurant, but it's also, you're seeing it a lot in the, in the supermarkets and the grocery stores as well. Um, I think specifically to restaurants, what the, one of the challenges in the, in the pizza business that I work with, uh, one of our challenges is we have, you know, we had a 36 item menu, right? And we had some items that were slow moving and we had food waste and the food waste was always something that you dealt with, but it was never catastrophic. Now when your revenues are down so much, uh, we found that our food waste was through the roof. And so the, the more tail end of our menu, it just didn't make sense to continue offering that. Number one, because we ended up the slow moving part, you just throw away so much. But number two, you want to make sure that your restaurant is in the peak hours of the day. Really, our restaurants and, and most other restaurants are now between five o'clock and 730 or so. They just do so much volume that they need to be super efficient in those periods because it's all been concentrated into a very small window. And the ultra complicated dishes, the tail of the menu, it just doesn't make sense to offer that. So I feel like there's a broad streamlining of what's happening, right? Cracker Barrel, Darden, all the Darden restaurants, Red Lobster and Olive Garden and all those, and, and really every restaurant company in our portfolio, everybody's streamlining. Uh, and I think it's probably a long-term benefit because what it tells you is you don't need to be all things to all people. You need to 
really draw a line in the sand of those places that you're exceptional and that you're distinctive and everything else, you know, falls away. It actually, the pandemic is a brush fire, right? It, it wipes away a lot and it leaves just kind of this core essence of what's left. I think you can make a very clear argument that, um, that it's good because it streamlines things, it simplifies things, and it gets back to what makes each of these restaurant concepts special in its own right. And I think that's true, and we're going to see that across multiple different avenues. I think you're going to see streamlining at retail as well um, as the, the cream rises to the top and the brands that really perform continue to perform. And I think also to your point, people are going to pick category, things that define categories. So when you go out to eat, you're going to choose consciously a place with an experience that you really want to because you're probably not going to go out to eat nearly as much as you used to. Um, and so I think that's really true across the board in restaurants. And uh, again, experience topping everything because you're now making a conscious decision to go out as opposed to before. Sometimes you defaulted to going out just because it was easier. The, 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 um, the thought process to choose to go out is different than it was four months ago and probably will stay that way for the foreseeable future. Yep, I agree. All right, another question we got in, um, what are changes to the labor force, particularly essential workers in fulfillment or production in the supply chain? Um, you know, I, and I, I think about this, you know, it's not necessarily just getting products to market, which we talked about and dealing with the supply chain, but it's making sure that your labor staff is safe as they are helping to get those products to market. It's making sure that the team of people um, working in your restaurants is safe or working in your supermarkets and your stores. Um, so, so what changes are, are you guys noticing in that in the labor? I'm not sure if... Wendy, do you want to start with that one since you're, that's your area well, of specialty? I mean, I can, I can certainly talk about what you, you know, you see front and center and, and some other things, you know, behind the scenes, but the amount of money that companies are investing in creating, um, safe work environments in manufacturing in the supply chain um, is quite substantial. And I think, you know, that is going to need to go on for the foreseeable future. I think there's going to be just a shift in um, expectations, you know, by, uh, on employee bases, you know, as we move forward. The, the impact of that is um, companies are going to need to manage that cost impact. Right, and I, I don't think we've have fully seen or realized, you know, how CFOs are going to be doing that, and CEOs and chief operating officers. How do you manage that? This you've got a large new investment that you never had before. Um, how do you manage and mitigate those costs uh, in, in everything? And I think that still is is yet to come. Um, and like all of you, uh, you you read in the the paper and see on the news how things are happening in the grocery stores and. Um, you know, with different employee employee bases. I think we're all in it together. And I think, um, you know, being able to create confidence and provide the right care and just be real empathetic with, with everybody and how do, you, how do you pull that forward. The last thing I would say is um, there are a number of um, services and, and companies that are very good in this space around training and compliance and quality systems. And all of those, those folks geared up uh, months ago to help get the right training in place that uh, helps everybody, you know, get through this in, in a safe way. And I've been in a hotel room for three days now, you know, and there's Clorox signs everywhere on everything. So I think how, how people get that through their, you know, through the hotel rooms as well and their staff, um, you know, is kind of the new normal of providing that confidence. The other, the other trend I'm seeing, and I'd be curious, you know, Matt, Chloe, if you guys are seeing this in your businesses, is this accelerated the trend of automation. So, you know, free flow, where I still sit on the board, um, you know, we had been moving progressively towards more automation, partially because we're located in California and the cost of labor is very high. But when you took that increase in cost of labor and then you took the considerable costs to make everybody safe and social distancing and the staffing requirements and everything else, it accelerated capital expenditure plans we had towards automation because we had to. Um, it, it just, it forced our hand. And so I'm curious if in your businesses and Chloe, I don't know how much of yours is contract manufacturing versus in-house manufacturing, but you know, seeing those changes in the way we design our manufacturing supply chain and logistics in order to be able to sustain through 
um, labor fluctuations. Um, for us, most, I mean, our, our retail space is very small. Um, so in terms of labor in store, we have not made many adjustments other than just like the processes and, and the way the store is operating. But labor wise, we, I would say the biggest change is our communication with our team. We've become so much closer with our store team as opposed to our corporate, the kind of the two are really have melded together more. Um, we have a lot more kind of communal meetings now so that we can check in on them, make sure they're feeling safe, uh, make sure they're trained properly. Um, but other than that, for our CPG business, it's mostly contracted manufacturing. So um, I, I, don't, I don't see much of the change there. I'm just not, I'm not privy to that. Um, on our end, I'd, I'd say we've had to increase some, some labor in terms of um, things like R&D is not gonna go the way it normally does for us. Um, we usually are able to you know, fly around and be able to meet our food scientists and do samplings face to face. And um, that's not no longer possible for the time being. So we kind of beefed up that team so that our R&D our team has a little more support. Brittany, you have another one? Yeah, I've got another question um, from another audience member. As a small craft spirits brand, we heavily depended on on-premise pre-COVID. Um, you touched on this a bit already, but are there particular, particular best practices or examples you're seeing in the industry that would help the small players maintain sales and awareness? Jordan, I don't know if you want to answer this or if Chloe, you want to talk about you know, how growing business yeah, I mean, spirits is really hard. Uh, Alcbev is a hard space because of all the legal limitations on how we can connect with consumers, especially if you're in the craft spirit space. That's a space where you're heavily restricted. You can't really do direct consumer the way a winery or a brewery theoretically could. Um, but speaking to your consumers and also really taking this time to connect with those on-premise accounts that are struggling the same way you are and, and creating that mutual empathy and support is really important. Um, you know, if, if you have the ability to weather the storm and get to the other side, um, they're going to remember the people that maintain com communication through this whole period, didn't just drop off a cliff, then magically reappear the dairy, there was something to sell. So using the time you've got to maintain consistent communication with your partners, your, especially your key partners, uh, has been critical. You know, I talk to my distributors for my winery, you know, we're, we do about 8,000 cases nationally, 26 states. I talk to every one of them once a month. Hey, how you guys doing? How's your family? Everybody healthy? How's the team? What are you seeing in the world? What can we do to support you? We've done virtual tastings. We've done a lot, just moved to a digital environment to the best we can. We're partnering with not-for-profits. That's another great opportunity is to partner with not-for-profits for fundraisers where you can sample your product in front of your key consumers, hopefully bolster some of that direct consumer business uh, and really connect in any way you can, because there's a great example. My brand is 90% on premise in wholesale. So I saw that business just dry up overnight. Um, and so we just had to pivot and get creative in other ways of, of driving revenue. And Chloe, do you want to add anything to that about, you know, just generally as a smaller business, um, moving forward right now? Yeah. Um, I mean, like Jordan said, I think a lot in our in our uh, CPG business, a lot of our ability to overcome a lot of the challenges we were could potentially have encountered was just like the relationships that we fostered with our uh, suppliers and um, same with our co-packers. We were just in constant contact and touch with them. They were able to give us heads up on on potential issues that we could you know could possibly turn into much bigger issues. Um, so that was kind of what helped us on the back end. And um, otherwise, I think, you know, again, it's always about being creative and finding a ways to connect with your consumer. I think we've, you know, tried to, you know, offer treats to frontline workers in every, in many different ways. Um, it's not as easy as you would think just because we're frozen. So not everyone can always accept what we want to give them, but um, just being able to kind of connect in that way. We're offering, um, 
free product to frontline workers at the store um, and just kind of communicating on social media, which is where, you know, we find it best to um, stay in touch and create a dialogue and kind of keep to uh, our, our platform kind of our approach is just kind of, even in these dark times is really to just keep it light and fun and happy and um, people know what where they go for what kind of content and we don't want to kind of pivot away from who we are even in in dark times so um, we've tried to really remain authentic and true to that spirit and then I guess one one last question um, which I love all of you and all of your inputs on but um, what would you say now to someone who is starting a, a food brand? Let's, uh, let's start with you, Chloe. Um, you know, I think it's really the same thing I would have said before um, all of this, which is that you just really have to believe deeply and passionately about what you're doing and about how you're going to differentiate yourself. Um, you know, that's always going to be the, the, my kind of motto for for starting something. Um, I think, you know, you have to also be willing to listen and able to pivot because I know, you know, we started as a retail soft serve business and um, realized after a few years in that uh, we were better and made just more sense to turn to uh, consumer packaged good, which is not how I, um, perceived or foresaw or anything. So I think uh, just, you know, you need to, you need the passion, you need the belief, the grit, and you need to really uh, be willing to, to roll with it. Wendy? Yeah, I think that, you know, I've been on a number of um, other webinars and phone calls with different entrepreneurial teams and institutes and uh, retailers. I think the biggest thing to think about is cash flow, right? So um, and that risk that, that Matt was talking about, it's, it, it takes a lot of money and, and lots of places where it can, you know, cash can dribble out. Um, I think as you start up any business, but now more than ever is make sure you're looking at whatever Excel spreadsheet you have on a, on a daily basis to manage cash flow. Cause once the cash is gone, you're done. Matt. Um, I think this is actually not the craziest time in the world to start a new business. And the reason I say that is that you have a lot of these brands who um, they raise a bunch of money, uh, they've spent it all on customer acquisition. They are sitting on shelves, some of the newer brands sitting on shelves um, and not being restocked in the right ways because preference is going toward the established brands. So some of those may not make it through. Um, and there's always, you know, there's, there are vintages always of, of startups and the rest. I think this will be a good time to be a good vintage. Uh, because there will be more opportunity coming out of this as the shelves are reset and, and there's more receptivity in the future. Uh, to me, it just comes back to the world is full of stuff and people don't need more stuff. So to the extent you can, if you believe deeply, like Chloe was saying, uh, which is the core of it all, uh, but if you believe deeply and you, and you have something that is unique and ownable and distinctive, um, the world is, is always, there's always room for more powerful brands and beautiful brands to be built but not stuff. So, you know, to, what, what I see is people are looking for brands that mean something that are powerful. And those are brands that, you know, people have got all the heart and all the time in the world for. So I think there's, I think there's a lot of opportunities still to be out there. I would add one more thing to that, which is um, own your home market. Um, I think the biggest mistake that um, early CPG or, or food beverage brands make is they expand too quickly. Expanding is very, very expensive. It's a lot of travel, it's a lot of meetings, it's a lot of salespeople. Um, so the best advice I can give is if you launch a brand, make sure you start in your home market or it doesn't have to be your home market where you physically live, but a home market and own that market first. Learn what your consumers need, learn how to pull off the retail shelf, build the data story and the success to then take and expand because expanding too rapidly it can be as much a recipe for disaster as it is for success. All right, so with that, I wanna thank our amazing panelists and Jordan for moderating um, and all of you for, for tuning in tonight. 
Uh, the next event will be July 14th at 6.30 p.m. Puffs Entrepreneurs Tackle Tough Questions, checking in on past 100K New Ventures competition winners, followed on July 27th at 6 p.m. with the next in our Amplify series, a crash course for first-time startup founders. Uh, links to those two events should be in the chat. Um, you can also find any of the videos, including tonight's um, on the Tufts Alumni YouTube channel. This one should be posted in the next couple of weeks, but our past events are all already there and you should also be able to find that in the chat. So with that, thank you so much and have a nice night.